to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Now we have presentations. Um, Matt Mohol regarding aquifer testing requirements. basically going to be a little bit of an overview of where Bernardsville is in relation to um, its surrounding communities and then what, there are three maps, what the watershed values are, which this is one, the water quality, and the water quantity. And this relates to uh, what Matt's going to be talking about, which is all in relation to the aquifer ordinance that we're trying to put together um, and, and probably pull and basically, the underlying theme to all of it is to protect the groundwater resources of the community. We have a certain amount of properties that are still uh, potentially available to develop in the community. I think we're looking at a list of a total of 45 properties that possibly have 20 acres or more. So in the future, you may have scenarios where whatever the potential may be that two landowners want to put their, combine their resources in you know, about 40 acres or 100 acres, whatever it may be. When you have that kind of scenario where development has the potential to occur, you're going to have a lot of wells. And, most, and those properties are all going to be within an area outside of the center of the borough. The center of the borough, which... You know, point so, the borough center is... I think it's right here. And most of our areas that we're going to be, that are potential for development are going to be outside, obviously, all these outlying areas. This is more in the center of Burnsville, about here. You can see all the roads, if it's clear, um, and this area basically here. So you obviously have non-well areas, which is the center of the borough area. Outlying areas are going to be the well areas, septic areas. All those two components will impact groundwater quantity. Run or the quality. Septic, obviously, whatever goes into the septic system has the potential to impact groundwater quality. How do these uh, values come about? How do we know that what's high, moderate, and low? Basically, through well testing, well analysis that have been developed in, in Burnsville and surrounding communities Harding, Menlo, and the borough, and the township, and the borough. So uh, Manchester. When you say wells, private wells, or you have test wells? More often than not, it's going to be pri private to wells, which are going to act as test wells, whether it's going through, there's a private well testing act, which requires well testing, sampling. That will then, um, it's data that gets generated. DEP has access to that data because it gets submitted to DEP, in addition to the local health department. Um, so they generate databases. Highland Council is part of that database generation. It's all GIS based, geographical information system. So that's how these maps basically get generated. So the well, the people that dig the well and maintain the mills, wells for these private residencies provide data to these agencies? When you have a new well that gets installed, uh, there are some testing requirements as part of that installation process, in addition to um, sampling that also needs to be done. If you have a transaction, a real estate transaction, where a residence or a property has a well on its property prior to that real estate transaction closing and such, you have to get that well tested. Um, so it has a 
a certain number of parameters you have to sample for, and those get analyzed. There's your quality database. If you're selling a house, or a house is turning over, what is being tested? The depth? The water? I mean, I'm just trying to figure out. That was Usually it's just the water is. quality, because that's what's going to be right. driving as part of the real estate transaction as to what's going on with the water quality so that the new owners coming in feel But that's a purity quality, not a quantity. Quality, qual correct. Okay, right. so... So the, part of our maps here relate to the quality, quantity, and then also where we are with the watershed area. And you, so get the, and you get the quantity from when they actually do the well and they actually test how many gallons per hour or whatever comes normally, out of that. Right. Okay. Normally as, as a requirement when wells get installed by a well driller for a particular property, it's a development, it's a residential area, um, there are certain testing requirements. That that, are, that's actually why we're here. Yeah, and that's actually why we're here. So that's being that's all integrated. So it's a whole complex things that combine to drive what we're trying to get at, basically. So do you have any data, existing data right now, about the amount of water and stuff that is produced from many of these wells? Or is it yeah, mostly the, the quality side? The health department does have a database where they've accumulated information over the years, which okay. we've actually looked at in the past in our critical waters resource study that we did for the borough, where we did look through some of that data. And when wells were installed, let's say 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. the well drillers will always do a test. It's usually a quick test to see what kind of yield that particular well will give. And recovery. Right. Recovery, pumping scenario, it's a short test, usually less than eight hours or somewhere around there. And they have Another one test is a specific capacity test, which will drive, which is a short, quick test to see what kind of potential yield that uh, well has. Um, five gallons a minute is what they're looking for, or five to ten gallons a minute, somewhere in that neighborhood, for a normal residential home that's supply that's needed. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that they would have tested in the past, which goes on a well record, which the health department has. That's the kind of thing we looked at in the past. In addition to that, there's also some data that we looked at that was water quality, nitrates, mm -hmm. uh, lead, any kind of other potential contaminants or arsenics, that kind yeah. of stuff, yeah. whatever exactly. that's, naturally that's occurring been, normally. Right. That's been uh, carried forward over the years where it's increased as to what's been happening uh, with so, water quality. So some of these quantity numbers may be old because it's based on when the house was probably built and the well was put in the house. Right, so then if you have a scenario where that particular old house now gets sold and has a well, now, today, you would have to go through the private well testing act to get that well tested and then you get some more parameters and data from that well okay. as to what's the quality. And we have access quality. to that data? The town? Um, town, well, health department is a regional basis, on a regional okay. basis, so we have the Burns, health, uh, Burns Township Health Department. They do have most of that information. It's going to be spotty at times. So yeah, if you, part if of you could provide that to us, it'd be useful. They, they can't give you the uh, individual property. Right. Okay. But, but what there is, there are some summary reports that have been prepared by the New Jersey uh, DEP that sometimes summarize what you would find in, in, on a countywide basis, okay. maybe, maybe a municipal basis, but usually they don't get that. Uh, specific level because they don't want to create a real estate issue. Sure. Okay. So, water quality. Um, again, Burnsville Borough, proximity right here. All the remaining area is um, outside the well um, water supply area. So you have all these these areas predominantly going to be septic and well service. Um, here it basically gives us the information on the map is the pinkish, purplish area are all the prime recharge areas in the borough. So in other words, when you have water hitting the surface, rain, water flowing through the borough, streams and so forth, how are they in interacting with the groundwater below the surface? Uh, so the purplish areas are going to be the prime recharge areas, so where the water will infiltrate and then recharge the groundwater. And that's critical. The more you develop, the less you have of this kind of prime area. 
and then that impacts water quality uh, in, in, in the long run. Where you have more runoff, because you have more development, you have more uh, pervious, impervious uh, surface areas and things like that that impact the water quality. So one of the goals here is obviously to protect the borough from that by having the ordinance so that there's certain requirements that we have to go through in order to you know, develop a piece of property, if it's developed based on quality and then also on how quantity of current ordinance is available. Um, on this map also you'll see some pumping areas. There's a pumping area here, and that's basically the large diameter wells that are United Water that is using. Um, I think this area right here, maybe Twin Lakes, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you have that area, then on 202 out going, there's one well over here, which I think is the is a complex, office complex, mm -hmm. past the buying restaurant mm -hmm. on the right hand side. <laughs> Another pumping area with these, um, I don't know if it's that visible on this map here, but these area here, or these qualifiers are basically well health protection areas with areas of influence over specific time periods. In other words, something that's going to be in the 12 year time period is the largest area around, furthest away from the pumping wells, which means that there is something that would happen on the outside, the water quality is impacted, it would take that approximate time of 12 years to reach the pumping center. So you have a buffer zone, so there's least, you have something outside that area, you have least amount of impact of your water coming into the well, which supplies neighborhoods. Do we have any data on those three wells? From the water um, company? Yeah, you can get data from the water company. Um, and I believe it would also, there's going to be some data that the state has, because these are water supply wells. So Bureau of Water Allocation would be one source. You can get information on And then also some of the well drawers. These wells are very old, most likely, in the 50s, earlier, possibly, that they were installed. Twin Lakes, most likely, that scenario. And those were usually drilled by only one or two or three companies in the state or in this area, the tri-state area. Uh, we have start off being one of them. So they, they also have access to a certain amount of information. And usually you can get some information out of it. Is there any way you can get that information from New Jersey American? Because that's um, like in a valley right there. It seems like the groundwater would have a tendency to you know, flood down to that area. That would be great information to start with. Yeah, you have a confluence of streams, too. Right. You know, if you look at the, in Twin Lakes, you have a stream component here, here, um, draining into this lower area right here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's, if there, and there usually is interaction between streams and groundwater. Absolutely. So that kind of thing will happen there. Um, so that's probably where you would see an increase if it's more runoff. Runoff from up on the hills of the properties, right. right? Potentially, yes. But you also have above it, you have prime recharge areas, yeah. which uh -huh. are less developed. Okay. All right. So protecting where the mean it's more wooded, which means it's more protected. You have larger land masses, or the property are uh, the property zoning is five acres, one acres, somewhere along those lines, maybe even larger. Again, those and, and you have a building envelope that's going to be smaller. So the, you, these areas then are going to be protected in one sense because they already have zoning requirements uh, and less developed. And that's the key behind all of this too. Less development, the more the water quality gets preserved in one sense. The next slide I think is the water quantity, which again um, also shows deficits um, for the community. Which I believe is all negative from here. So the available quantity of water is going to be less in these zones. That's uh, this color, which is not really on this area, but this, the yellowish, and this brownish color, which is predominantly up here. Uh, there is a deficit zone, which again is a prime recharge area also. So they go so hand in hand. So that means that there is less water coming into the system. Overall, and that looks like it's Mendham. Uh, no, this is still Birds and Burrow. Here's a uh, line, and all the way comes back down around this or this way around here. And the so brown is a deficit. Brown deficit. The uh, lightish, bluish color here. You're at or very near, almost zero, uh, being a, a deficit point. So it's swinging back and forth. 
um, this area you are in more of a positive amount of ground. Uh, this correlates with the recharge zones too, but you may have some um, areas that are going to be less rechargeable, more rechargeable, all depends on what kind of stuff is going on uh, with development and so forth. Now, this data is from, it says 2016, this was a 10. 215. 215. Was there a prior map? 2015 is when the copyright, 2016, April 1, when this may have been printed out or this was generated. Is there a prior map we can compare the prior map to this map? Um, there, I, I don't know whether there is, there is okay. historic information with the Highlands. I'm sure there is. Yeah, it says so, right there, 2014 GIS date. Okay, so the Highlands region. Right, so you're going to have some a one year only, too. But it's only one year, right? 14 versus 15, correct? I don't know where it says 14 versus 15, but... For, underneath the uh, the scale, under the zero. Okay. Jersey Highlands region. Region, right. 14, 15. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be nice if we could get a map that's five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years older. The right. comparative. Right. And, and those are the things... To I see a trend, you know, if there's a trend, sure. you'd like to see it. Sure, But there's also, a, um, you know, this is a, a resource that can be used then mm -hmm. for... Uh, looking at developing areas or not developing areas. Because if you do see a trend where you have negative or de deficit going on, mostly in the borough, then you see a trend, you want to try to do least amount of development. Right, because right. now you're going to have more withdrawal if you develop properties, which means you have more water taken out, which means you have less groundwater to work with. Because there's less meat charge. Well, they have yellow in the Great Swamp wildlife region, which is <laughs> pretty amazing. Right. I have relatives live there. It's, uh, there's a lot of water there. Oh, yeah, it's a swamp area, but you also have a clay layer which prevents mm -hmm. water from filtering down at a time. Yeah. So that's creates that uh, scenario at times too. Um, anyway, so this all leads into the reason for the um, aquifer ordinance to help protect the groundwater resources of the community. Thoughtfully, so that when we look at a development, that we have certain procedures that we should be going through to make sure that the community can withstand the potential for more development. That's one of the key things behind this. So, without further ado, Matt Mo. Um, just give a quick background. My name is Matthew Mohall. I'm a professional geologist. Been uh, practicing in New Jersey and uh, Pennsylvania for a very long time. My hair was a lot darker, a lot thicker at that time uh, than it is today. Uh, I work for a lot of municipalities with ordinances like this, um, including uh, Mercer, in Mercer County, Huntington County, Sussex County, uh, Passaic County. Um, there's not many yet in Somerset County, but uh, Hillsborough and Montgomery Township both have ordinances similar to this too where they were undergoing significant development pressure. And I, I've drawn this map here because it, what I really want to talk about first off is the differences in the um, aquifer characteristics in Burnsville. The upper portion here, the dark portion, the uplands, mostly the hilly area of the town, of the borough, that's billion-year-old crystalline rock, and it's not highly fractured. Uh, the reason it's been around for a million years is because it doesn't fracture very easily, it doesn't break apart, it doesn't weather very easily. It's the reason you have the, these are the high areas of your, of your municipalities because they don't weather out and they're resistant. Along 202, for the most part, you have, which you've probably all heard before, but the Ramapo Fault. That separates the older rocks from the younger rocks. We all worry about that fault moving, hasn't been a lot of movement in a long time. But that, that fault is what we term a border fault. Typically, and that's probably why you saw the Twin Lakes one and the, then the other one, Major Well, to the uh, north of the village, that's an area where you typically will find a lot more water because water moves through fractures in the rock. Down in the uh, southeastern portion of the township, we have, for the most part, Piedmont version rocks, or Triassic, Jurassic rocks, so the red shales, sandstones that are associated with it. Those are the, the uh, younger rocks. They tend to fracture not only along the fault lines, but also with um, bedding planes. 
if I'm going to borrow the Bible for a second, basically you're going to see bedding planes that are all like each sheet of the, of the Bible. And that's, that, so that kind of, uh, typically those rocks are going to have more water, significantly more water than the crystalline rocks are up top. You're going to find more water right along the edge of the fault where you have a lot more fracturing than in other areas of the township, of the borough. Part of the reason I was asked to get involved in this, uh, back in 2011, 2012, there was an application from the planning board. I was retained by the planning board to assist them as their expert. Um, and that application came uh, for a number of houses that were going to be built on a piece of property, and they were having problems with water. And one of the questions the, the uh, planning board asked is, uh, how much water do you have? Do you have enough water for you to meet your demands of your homes? The applicant went out and did some testing and found out that they had some problems with some of the wells out there. And as a result, I was called in to help evaluate it. There was an ordinance that the applicant's expert was pretty much following an ordinance that I had drafted for Hopewell, New Jersey, and um, used that procedure to kind of guide him because Burnsville didn't have an ordinance at that time. Um, after that application was complete, the Environmental Commission um, asked me to, to help them in drafting an ordinance, which we did, and then that ordinance is what is in front of you tonight. And the reason for that is we... Just a quick question. Um, what, what are the numbers correspond to on the bottom? This is time. Okay, time. Okay? And ordinarily, <coughs> what I'm looking for in an aquifer test is, as I pump a well, I should see straight drawdown along a straight line in time, on this time scale. So basically, the same amount of drawdown that I see from 10 minutes to 100 minutes, and in this particular case, about two and a half feet, I should see two, another two and a half feet, or I should be about pretty close to, to five feet between 100 minutes and 1,000 minutes. I'm actually going to be a little bit more than that, probably because we hit a, uh, a fracture that was dewatering a little faster. So this is a, what I would term a standard textbook result of pumping. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't get that. Can you just go over that again? Sure. Okay. Ordinarily, what I should see is this straight line. Okay? So it's time on the that's bottom. That's time on the bottom. And this is draw. This is how much draw the down. water level is lowered in a well. So as you draw water out, yep. you turn a faucet okay. on and draw water you're out. You're going to see the water level drop down. Okay. Now, initially, you're going to see a little bit of difference there. And that's because not all wells are efficient. But over a period of time, what I should see is that from from let's go here, from 100 minutes, where I'm at about two and a half feet, to 1,000 minutes, where I should be about six, where this line will cross through at six feet. I should see, so I'm basically three and a half feet of draw. Okay. I should see that same thing from 1,000 minutes to 10,000 minutes. Okay? So basically six and a half to a little bit more than nine feet for, for the most part. That's what you should see. So if you pump a well continuously, that's what you, textbook-wise, you should, should have okay. to have. What we look for, though, sometimes is not only do we see a change in the pumping that's taking place here, okay, and then um, in this particular case, what we did was, this is part of that application we saw, and we saw the water level draw down, and then what happens was the, the uh, as part of the test, he, sh he slowed the pump down and tried to see how much water was coming into the well to hold the constant rate. So what's, what he's trying to do is calculate how much water is coming into the well from the aquifer. Okay? And then he turns the pump off, and what we should see is the water level recover fairly rapidly back up to the same where point it was. One of those applications, this is what we saw. We saw a drawdown come down. We were able to hold the constant rate at about a gallon a minute, which is not a whole lot of water. And then they shut the pump off, and you can see after basically what was the equivalent of the same amount of time that we were pumping, the water level was still here. A day later it took before it got up there again. So in other words, this homeowner probably would have run into trouble if they wanted to use their well much. Doing What's that point out there? Minutes. That's, that's a day later. Hours. That's, that's 1,440 minutes. That's about a day. Or almost. Yeah, yeah it's almost 2,000 minutes. 2, so that's, yeah. yeah. So you can see it took quite a long time for the well to be covered. So what was the ultimate depth of that well? This well was about 500 uh, feet deep. 
Um, it had been deepened already once, and they ended up uh, deepening it, uh, actually replacing it with another well to get to get enough water. And there was the, the option was there because it was a five acre lot, mm -hmm. so there's enough option to move to a better location on the property and put another well in. So on this particular property, there was a huge variation. There were a couple wells that were very good producers, and then several other wells that were not at all. And where was the location roughly of this? Was it up in the hills or was it's it down? Okay, yeah. it was up in the hills. So when a, a person comes in to drill a well, a company comes in to drill a well, how do they make the decision? Where do they drill? What's What are they looking for? Usually they just put it in close they to the house. They just close to the house. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I get hired quite often to go out and help identify fractures on properties yeah. and the never frags. try to, to do that. Yeah. Um, but that's, you know, that is... You know, that's, that's somebody paying for that service. Okay. Um, you find that a lot in one of your neighboring municipalities where it's they actually are having a lot of problems finding water supply. That? So that's and in that, the metamorphic region up above. Yeah, that, that, so you get, that's in the, the crystalline rock, the metamorphic and igneous rocks. Um, Where's yeah. that, sir? That's the higher areas of the... Of the so you had to hit more around 350 before it actually kind of opened up where you could actually get water. No, they, they didn't get any barely any water. They, they basically drew it down. This is a this is pumping at about 10 gallons a minute here. But here you can see it took, they were pumping at about a, less than a gallon a minute to try to get it to hold the head of the water in, in the well. And then they turned it off and it was coming back at less than, well less than a gallon a minute. Okay, so but they got another well, right? They do. We had okay. to join another well. But okay. we were there able to tell with the help of this, of planning out of this, using an ordinance similar to this, we were able to get identify an area and then help them put a well in a better location. And is, anywhere in this, are you impacting, you know, the septic fields and stuff that's sending water back down underground? Uh, we, one of the things we do with the ordinance is the way it's developed and we've used it successfully in, in a lot of towns is try to get, make sure that the septic system is not going to have that impact to a person's well. Because water coming out of the septic system is contaminated. Last thing we want to do is get that into the well. Not only with bacteria, but all sorts of other chemical <coughs> compounds. And so, uh, and most of the time, it doesn't really ever get back down into the fractures. It has to hit a fracture in order to go back down again. What we oftentimes see is that it's traveling along the bedrock surface. If, if I were to take this table and load some sand up on it and tilt it, I pour water through it, it's going to hit the top of this table and it's not going to go any further vertically. And so it's going to slide off the table. If I, and this would be similar to a lot of times with the bedrock surfaces in, in the, the borough. If I were to <coughs> cut some holes in the table, I get some of that water to go down through that rock. And, and it may be 5%, 10% that actually gets down into the aquifer. What you don't want is to have that take contamination down. That's why we do, a lot of times, I, do, I did this for um, Burns Township where we looked at both the water supply and we also looked at the septic system impacts to de determine what zoning would be necessary to sustain it. the quality of the water and the quantity of the water would uh, uh, ba basically, so there wouldn't be any adverse impacts, mm -hmm. minimize that potential for adverse impacts. Um, a lot of times when we're doing this test, we also don't want to see this type of condition where you see it follow along and then a sudden drop off. What this is telling us is that we've hit a fracture and all the water is coming in through this shallow fracture here and, and uh, to about, well this is actually about a depth of 57 feet, even though it's, uh, this is drawdown, so that's from the water level in the well beforehand. But that fracture is about 57 feet below the ground surface. We kept pumping that well 300 gallons a minute or uh, yeah, 370 gallons a minute, and we, what ended up happening was the water level on the well just declined so rapidly we had to shut it off because we were getting air and all sorts of other problems in there. So, is that because the casing probably wasn't set to the No, the casing rock? was set perfectly. It, what it was was the fracture in the rock that they were in the same shale rock as you have in, in uh, the southeastern portion of the township, but all the water was coming in through a, a shallow set of fractures. And, which, and that was all it. Once that, the well intercepted that at 57 feet, once you drew the water level down below that point, you now had problems with uh, cascading, the water literally, uh, like a waterfall, right. and that stirs up a lot of 
some other things. Now I also get air in the system. Um, not only that, I had uh, uh, that I could not have continued to pump at that rate. It would have basically stopped pumping at about 2,000 minutes. We would have drawn the water level down to 400 feet below ground surface by that time, which was the bottom of the well. Uh, so that's that, that's a couple of things we were looking for when we, we did this ordinance. And what I, I've had experience with in other municipalities where we've had this. And this is a case in um, Passaic County where under the ordinance we, we require that the well be monitored, after pumping, the water level be monitored for recovery. And what we're looking for here is, did the water get removed permanently from the aquifer? How long will it take to recover? And you can see here all the wells that were monitored during this one test. Well 5 is the pumping well. That's the blue well here. And at one day, uh, after pumping ended, okay, the water level in that well was still uh, more than 50 feet below where it started out. Basically, water was removed from the aquifer and wasn't going to come back into that aquifer until the next heavy duty rain. And what we ended up having to do because of the ordinance was we were able to go back, get the applicant to produce the number of units that was going to be built on this property so it better matched what the water supply resources were for that county, for that, uh, that site. And so what we've done with the ordinance, this is another example of that you can see. This was a test that was done in 2014. At the end of pumping, the water level was down 200 feet below ground surface. Here it is uh, a week or more later, two weeks later, and the water level still never recovered all the way back up to where it was. The purple line was where it was before the pump was turned on. And that shows us that we don't have the capacity in that aquifer to sustain the homes because the homeowner needs to use the well the next day. If the water level is 200 feet lower than it was the day before, then he's in trouble because now he's going to draw it down even further and you're going to end up with the, uh, the well. So we'll, what the ordinance was and what we've used it for in a lot of municipalities is to basically have an applicant come to the board, the planning board in this particular case, with a hydrogen geologic evaluation. And what they would be required to do is come in, um, prior to submitting their application, they would submit an applicant test plan. And in that plan, they would submit to the borough, and in that plan, it would highlight the wells that they're going to install, their expected plans of development based on the zoning and other issues, and their site layout. And uh, usually it's in conceptual phase. And then they would lay out a series of wells. And depending upon how many homes they're going to build, there's a number of observation wells that they would require. Each of those observation wells will later on be used as a well for one of those homes, unless that well happens to be too bad, or there happens to be a problem with it. So the intent is they come in with the information, they do an aquifer test, um, they, they, they have that test evaluated by a hydrogeologist, and that hydrogeologist then comes and makes a presentation to the, to the planning board and says, this is how many, how many properties we have Here's where our septics are, so that we don't have our septic systems interpact, uh, impacting our uh, wells. Here's where our wells are located with respect to that. Uh, here's why they're located with that. Here's the aqua testing we did. And as part of that process, they notify the neighbors that they're going to do this test. And this was a discussion uh, that needs to be made at uh, the municipal level, not for me. but as to how, much, how far out we notify the neighbors. Most of the municipalities I work for, the notification extends about 500 feet beyond the property boundaries. And the reason is you're let, letting everybody know around you that this aquifer test will be going on. If you want to participate in the test, um, we will, the applicant will monitor water levels in your well or, or up to a maximum of three wells. And that those water level data will be used in the report to identify potential impacts on off-site or existing wells. So homeowners around the area are going to know if they're going to be impacted. So when they come into the planning board and they're in the audience and they say, hey, you know, you're going to impact my well, ideally we should have black and white data to tell us whether they're going to have an impact on that well or not, because that would be collected in the data. The other part is if they have a shallow well, more uh, 100 feet or less, they are, they, they are automatically included 
in the process to have their well monitored simply because the well is shallow and it's more susceptible to being affected by somebody pumping. What is the current policy here for the planning board for a new construction with wells? There is there basically it's a, it's, a, it's a, a notice that yes I I I believe we have enough water. So you don't need to show data on on no, test wells. No, and in that in the case that we were talking about before, that applicant fortunately basically said, look, let's bring in an expert, take a look at it. We have some issues with our wells, and they did. Okay. Uh, the planning board had an, an inkling that there was a problem up there already. So they suggested it. At least that's my understanding. Do you, does anybody know that property he's talking about? Yes. Where, where is it? Why? It's a, no, it's a plan. Why is it confidential? Uh, it's presented as a plan. I, I just usually don't talk about specific properties, but it was standard here. Yeah. Sheer bluff prop application. Thank you. Yeah. I'm sorry? It's an approved application. Oh, up there. Okay. Yeah, we, we, that was probably took over a year, ultimately, to get through the process because of all the different issues with the water supply. And the idea of this is that to make it a little bit faster, that you know ahead of time whether you've got an issue. And there's specific cases if you don't, if you run into this type of situation where your water level is not going to come back, the applicant knows they've got to reduce the number of units that they're going to build. How much building are we doing? It's three houses there. I mean, Sorry. how are many we doing a lot of building? There's only one. Okay. There's like two new wells yeah. in the borough in the last like three years that I know of. Sorry. Risk of properties combining. Could you explain to me exactly when somebody does a quick test honest, I don't understand this. on a new property and it passes or fails? What exactly is that perk test measuring? Perk test is, is simply evaluating whether the water coming out of the septic system is going to infiltrate the soils and disappear. So that's purely okay. That's all you're doing. You're just seeing what a rough infiltration estimate. Um, it's not something we would, okay. as hydrogeologists, we ever use. To be honest with you, it's just not reliable. So how deep it's did they have to go to that for that well in Vanderveer? Uh, they went. Uh, they went on a few of the wells, 500 feet. Some of the wells were shallow. Some of the wells were in very good conditions. And actually, one well was very good. We went to the neighbor's property right next door, and he had three wells that were not very good. So I mean, but we don't know what the depth of the other wells were, though. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but they, right. some of them were 250. Some of them All right, so he, the he dropped it down to 500. Okay. And that's probably more of a shell material. There, no, right? that was the crystalline rock. Okay. Yeah, we were up in the crystalline rock in that area. You got just above the 202. Okay. Northwest of it. So the intent is to have an applicant come to the planning board with all the information ahead of time um, so that they can tell you whether the, the application can be supportive. There's water resources there. If they're going to be mining water, you want to know that so that you can at least start to cut back, not let that happen. If there's a particular case where one or two wells is not going to sustain the house that is going to be built on that property, you want to know that. The intent of the ordinance is to really make sure that the, that the development has the water resources um, and the aquifer can transmit the water to wells to meet the demands of the homes that are, are proposed there. And um, from that perspective, and also to ensure the neighboring property owners that their wells are not going to be adversely affected by the pumping that's going to take place there. And if you have any more questions, I'm glad to answer them. I didn't want to go into too much detail on or even death on the ordinance, but I could. Well, thank you for the education. Anyone else? The so do we have any specific areas in the town that are at greater risk? Um. Anything in this upper portion of the township <coughs> is always has that potential for having um, adverse impacts because the fractures tend to be very small, like on the microscopic scale, and not very extensive. Advantages. 
person pumping here is not going to affect the person pumping here oftentimes. But this guy may not have enough water to sustain his demands, and then eventually what happens is he lowers the water level enough that this person over here is adversely affected. If you're removing water permanently from the aquifer system. We saw that in Lebanon Township, in Hunterdon County, where it was bad. Again, some of the development has to be reduced in its capacity. And do you typically find problems like this with our size zoning, where you know, we have a lot of five, ten acre? Five to ten acre usually is enough to sustain the homes. The, the issue is um, it's finding the, the location on, on a particular lot. But there can be impacts where you have homes that are affecting other homes nearby or other homes on the, on the area, or in some cases where the septic system, which you rely entirely on the septic system, uh, to meet the demands. You're pumping water out, and 80% of it's going back to the septic system, and they're hoping it gets back into the aquifer. Um, we, we see that. So, usually you don't, but sometimes you will find circumstances where you can find an issue. So at the Vanderveer Bluff place, that was <coughs> metamorphic, he had to go down 500, so there's less of a chance for him to bother his neighbor's wells because of the transmission on a horizontal plane. Whereas if you came lower down, and got into the sedimentary, you would have that issue you, more you, you could, towards the if, bottom line. If you, usually in the crystal rock, the fractures are so tiny and microscopic that you wouldn't affect. You, you, you don't often see that adverse influence nearby. We right. did see some of it up there, but nothing other case. It was I've, I've had other projects in the crystal rock that one I showed you a few minutes ago, this one, where you can see the number of wells that were affected. They were pumping this well here at one, about two gallons a minute. And you can see water levels were drawn down in some of these wells, 150, 200 feet in the area. So that's crystal, that's the same exact crystal rock. You have, it just depends upon where it is in the, in the particular case. But did that affect the other wells? It did affect other wells. It affected a lot of other wells in the area, and as a result of that, that development had to be reduced in size. So on our, our existing homes in these areas, um, if somebody needed to drill a new well or increase the depth of their current well, they would have to come for a permit? No. That, that's not in there because they wouldn't be coming back in front of the planning board with the second. No, I'm talking to building and zoning and building. Do they have to get a permit no, I, for that? No. no. All no? they do is fill out an application. Application upstairs. So they have a record of houses in the town that had problems with their well, where they needed a new well or to dig deeper to get a, a well that worked the right way. They might. Okay. The, the, pro the problem is, I'm, I'm Paula Stewart, I'm the acting chairman of the Environmental Commission. I looked at a lot of the data in the Burns Health Department. We did a Freedom of Information Act, and I went through about five years of data. And there isn't anything on the form as it stands right now that's submitted to DEP that says really why the, the well is being drilled. And we had someone who came to us to a meeting and said, I know that one of my neighbors had lost all their water on purpose. Well, that makes sense. Why would they come with an application unless they had a problem? Right? Because, well, there are other reasons. And, and those other reasons include watering their lawns and their shrubbery. And because we also have no restriction on how many wells you can have on the property, and as Matt said, on one of the adjoining properties uh, to this Vanderveer application, um, there were at least three, maybe four wells. And because that property was right on that fault line, and on one side, the next door neighbor had water, and he didn't. So he had three different wells to supply his house and his yard, or whatever. And it's only going to get worse. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not going to improve in terms of, of um, and not having any restrictions at all on what people can do. Um, you know, we we think that it's an issue for the future, and that's why the Environmental Commission is trying to address it sure. and to say that um, we think we need more tools uh, within our boards to be able to address it, so that we don't fear the application, so to speak. <laughs> so I have two questions, roughly. What, what is it going to cost a developer or whatever to do all this testing? 
Pick the number right. In round numbers. Ballpark, it, it's probably about 15,000 15, to maybe 20,000 that they won't recoup from, in the, in the sense that they won't recoup from the fact that they're putting it in a well on a property that they're going to sell. The, all the wells go, are going to go in anyway. The developer's going to pay for that. It's the cost of the hydrogeologist to do the testing. And it's also comfortable to them because now they know that they've got water supply. So, is that per well? No, total for the testing. So if they have three lots, mm -hmm. six lots, ten lots, it's going to cost basically within that range usually. I mean, it depends on what, um, how, how, how many more wells are going to monitor, of course. But usually that number doesn't increment, that, that's not a huge increase if you go from six lots to ten lots, let's say. I'm just saying it's got to be pretty expensive to drill a well in the metamorphic rock and go down and do that. Those costs are going to be incurred anyway because the well driller, I mean, the, the, the applicant's going to put a well on the property to show that he's got water supply to sell it. Most people don't, won't even, the banks won't even lend you the money anymore unless you prove that you've got the water right anymore. And I thought you can't get a building permit also until you can state that you that, have that water. That could be it. Municipal requirement. I think it's a municipal requirement. I know it is in Pot Pottersville. My other question is: Is anyone here on the planning board now? Um, oh, sorry, Mike. Why did I mean the original proposal that Mike gave here was for a subdivision with two or more lots, correct? But the planning board came back with five, which seems, other than um, Meadowbrook Farm, I'm not sure how many properties left unless several property owners got together. That's a policy that's, decision. Well, but, that's what I was saying. I but mean, we're, we're, looking, we're looking at an ordinance that said five, and I'm sort of going, five, other than Meadowbrook Farm, what would it apply to? So if we're looking at this, so, yeah. why, why was the planning board thinking of recommending five, you know, if, if a, a lot was going to be subdivided into five sub... Could have been the groups. cost. Could have been the cost incurred. Yeah, but if we're trying done. to protect the wells and the neighbors, you would think that number would need to be lower than five. That's why we left it into and what we submitted to from the environment. Right, but we've seen two different things, because Frank Matola sent us something that changed the 500 feet to 200 feet, and... That's a different, that's a different situation, and I think there was some... Um, Maybe I'm confused. Yeah, I think there was some confusion at the planning board about that, um, and the, the issue, we, uh, I think it was the, the confusion, I think, resulted from a, a question of notice of neighbors, which is usually um, tax control of 200 feet. What, what we were proposing, because there were some neighbors in this application which we talked about uh, extensively in one, um, that were 500 feet away, that would not have had notice that anything was going on because they weren't within 200 feet on a tax map. Mm -hmm. And what we were saying is that it wasn't the notice of <coughs> coming in for the application itself, but just to be noticed about the well test. Right. And I think that was where there was some confusion um, on the part of the, uh, the evening that we presented that to the planning board. And, um, but that was the spirit of it, is that to, to try to, to impact, make the sure that, you know, could potentially be impacted, could be impact, the impact could be as much as 500 feet away. And so that's why, you know, that was in there originally. And that and that's that was some, as I said, some confusion on the part of the conversation. It was, you know, got late, and mm -hmm. you know how that goes. Oh, I know. <laughs> but that was the reason. It okay. was within 500 feet for just for the well testing portion, not for the application itself, oh. because then that would broaden, that, and that would cost more for the applicant to sell, you know, for many more certified. Well, I think it said only three, you know. So you could say, I'd like my well tested, you know, because of this adjacent development going in, but they are only obliged to do three? Three. Three basically um, fo focusing on the wells that are most likely to be open. Okay. But it still seems, going back to the other, the bigger question in my mind is, why would you limit it to, you know... We're not recommending so, that it be limited. It's okay, the, it's to, the, to from five. the Environmental Commission, we're, we're You're saying two, it should be two and I guess I was trying to figure out why our planning board was saying recommending well, five because it seems to make it almost a, not applicable. There was one 
in particular opinion that you know person felt very strongly that it should only be for major subdivisions. And, and I actually um, did receive a list from Jeff Price, and there are 45 properties between 200 down to 20 acres. And uh, one of the things that I testified to at the planning board was that um, before I came to live in New Jersey 15 years ago, I lived in Fairfield County, Connecticut, in a minimum two acre zone across what had been a farming community in Fairfield County. And there were people who were losing water then, and that was now 18 years ago. And, um, and, there, and there, again, were no requirements. Mm -hmm. And that was you know, sort of how I first got interested in conservation. <laughs> Um, I didn't lose my water, but but people that I knew did. Well, I, I remember several years ago. I can't tell you how many, but you know there was one of those drought summers, and so I remember hearing I several people know. needed. Was it ninety nine? Ninety nine, two thousand one, two thousand two. Um, right. right. And, that, and that was the time period drill, when drill. I was leaving Connecticut. So, um, and and the people right behind me and where I lived in Connecticut um, got together and put you know a sixty acre parcel and forty acre parcel and built. And it was a, a huge development, you know, with tie shaped things going in every direction to make it two acres. So it does happen, you know, people, circumstances change, they move, they don't want to live in the area anymore, or, you know, grandchildren or whatever, and it does happen. So we're trying to look to the future to say that um, we feel that, you know, as Matt said, the wells, if, if someone's doing a development, they have a huge burden of expense. and. Uh, their wells are going to go in anyway. But the only additional cost is to have the um, is to have the analysis done ahead of time, and it really is a tool for the toolbox of our boards to uh, be able to more uh, appropriately evaluate whether there is going to be adequate water. So, thank you. Anything else for me? No, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? I guess I go back to, you know, I, I can see a need to for future planning, but it seems like limiting it to five subdiv subdividable plots is too high. It takes it I guess it would be out of the realm of depending on the size of the house. If each one had like five or six bedrooms and everything else, you're using a lot more water and they're gonna do irrigation and everything else. I mean if they're like three bedroom homes and everything else. Uh, let me tell you it might something. be different. Yeah. Teenage boys take a lot of shit. <laughs> Sorry. Not going there. Seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you want to continue to review this matter, or? Yeah. Yeah. With the I mean, that was a good education. Okay. Good information, and thank you for the excellent presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll continue to review. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And what, what is the next step in this? Um, the governing body will review all the data we have in front of us and that you presented with us. And Paul, if you get additional information, which Mr. Right. Delia requested some, and we'll continue to review it as a governing body and then um, decide what action. Will there be another meeting? Or? Um, yes, we'll have another meeting because we have a draft ordinance now. So we'll see. And, and, and can we also invite the plan? I would say we refer to the planning board also. Yes, we'll refer it back to the planning board with recommendations from this body as we move forward. Or maybe invite the planning board here and we can have an open discussion. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. All right, I'm going to read a proclamation into the record as part of presentations. Uh, it's a proclamation supporting the click of the ticket mobilization of May 23rd to June 5th, 2016. Whereas there were 560 motor vehicle fatalities in New Jersey in 2015, and whereas a large percentage of motor vehicle occupants killed in the traffic crashes were not wearing a seatbelt, and whereas the use of a seatbelt remains the most effective way to avoid death or serious injury in a motor vehicle crash, and whereas the National um, Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that 135,000 lives were saved by seatbelt uses nationally between 1975 and 2000, and whereas the state of New Jersey will participate 
and a nationwide <coughs> click it or ticket seatbelt mobilization from May 23rd through June 5th, 2016 in an effort to raise awareness and increase seatbelt usage to a combination of high visibility enforcement and public education. And whereas the Division of Highway and Traffic Safety has set a goal of increasing seatbelt usage rates in the state from the current level of 91% to 93%, and whereas a further increase in seatbelt usage in New Jersey will save lives on our roadways. Now therefore, I, Kevin Suey, Mayor of Borough Bernardsville, on the 25th day of April 2016, declare support for the click it or ticket seatbelt mobilization, both locally and nationally, from May 23rd through June 5th, 2016, and pledge to increase awareness of the mobilization and the benefits of seatbelt use. Okay. Approval of minutes. On March 28th, Mrs. Waite was absent, and April 11th, um, any changes to the minutes? No. no alterations? No. Okay, I entertain a motion. Um, second. Moved by Mr. Youngblood, second by Councilman Schmidt. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain, the ayes have it. All right, at this point in the meeting, the Mayor and Council welcome comments from any member of the public to help facilitate an orderly meeting and permit the opportunity for anyone who wishes to be heard. Speakers shall limit their comments to five minutes. If reading from a prepared statement, please provide a copy, an email copy to the clerk's office after making your comments so it may be properly reflected in the minutes. Anybody from a public question to be heard? No? Seeing none, I'll close the open session and move to ordinances. I'll right, open a public hearing on ordinance 16 1713, an ordinance concerning special event banners and temporary signs in the right of way and amending chapter 4 of the borough code entitled general licensing. I'll open a public hearing on this matter. Anybody from the public wishing to be heard? Council members? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to pass on final reading and adopt as published. So moved. Moved by Councilman Waite. I'll second. Second by Councilman Youngblood. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I'll open a public hearing on 16-1714, establishing parking restrictions at the Bernersville Railroad Station parking lot when the farmer's market is in operation and supplementing and amended Chapter 8 of the Borough Code entitled Parking Lots and Off-Street Traffic Regulations. Anybody from public wish to be heard on the matter? Council members, any comments? All right, seeing none, I'll close the public session. Take, entertain a motion to pass on final reading and adopt as published. No. I'll move. I'll move. Moved by Councilman Schmidt. I'll second. Second by Councilman Waite. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 I want to make a motion um, to move that 16 1715 appropriating $500,000 in the capital improvement fund for various equipment as listed in the 2016 municipal budget, budget be introduced by title, passed on first reading, and published according to law and that a public hearing be scheduled for a meeting beginning at 7 p.m. on May 9, 2016. Have a motion? I'll move. Move by Councilman Youngblood. I just have a question. In that is 80,000 for the Claremont steps, and we're going to discuss that later. I, it seems like there's a... Well, it was in the budget. Yeah. You don't have to spend it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Move. Move. I did. Move by Mr. Youngblood. Second. We have a second. Second by Mr. D. Porter. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. The ayes have it. I'll entertain a motion to move at 16 1716, appropriating $12,500 from the recreational slash pool capital improvement fund for acquisition of various equipment, be introduced by title, passed on final reading, published according to law, and that a public hearing 
be scheduled for a meeting beginning at 7 p.m. on May 9, 2016. I'll move. Moved by Councilman Schmidt. Second. Second by Councilman Wait. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? The ayes have it. <coughs> All right, I'll entertain a motion to move that 16 there's 17 17 concerning the inspection of owner occupied multiple family dwelling units and amending chapter 15 of the borough code entitled fire prevention and amending, amending chapter 11 of the borough code entitled property maintenance be introduced by title passed on first reading <coughs> published according to law and that a public hearing be scheduled for a meeting beginning 7 p.m on may 9 2016. I have a motion. Move. Moved by Mr. Deportier. Second. Second by Mr. DeLeo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay, the ayes have it. It passes. All right, I'll entertain a motion to move. That's 16 1718 ordinance to appropriate contribution from the fire slash first aid organization for the refurbishment of a first of first aid equipment. Be introduced by title, passed on first reading published according to law, and that a public hearing be scheduled for a meeting beginning at 7 p.m. on May 9, 2016. Move. Move, moved by Mr. Deportier, second. second by Councilwoman Waite. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Abstain? Seeing none, the ayes have it. All right, resolutions. Anybody have any questions you want to pull in for discussion? None. None. 1694. Okay, 1694. All right. You want to pull it or you just have a question? Anyone else? No, let's discuss. What is this for? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a great submission for the Dutchess Square House prepared by the Friends of Historic Burns. So we need a resolution from the borough as you guys are owners of that that we can go ahead and submit the grant. And it grants to the county? Okay. Yes. Okay. And it, there was not I didn't see a dollar amount on it. it um, normally, I don't put that on there, but we that's because there's two. The estimate of the 125,000 is given two options. So the first option was for two hundred and almost thirty thousand dollars, which picks up the main house, but also included some drainage work, uh, repair to a foundation wall in the basement, um, and repair of doors. It's a comprehensive exterior fix-up, um, but this is a tough year because I just learned today that there are 10 applications asking over $2 million, and uh, so you have to submit a second <coughs> So what I did is I removed the drainage, and the doors, and some of the other work, but it would still include um, removing all the shingles, repairing the clouds, repairing all the windows, Still be seen at the outside of the building without some of the other parts, and that reduced the request to 150,000. So I was specifically asked by the county last year, and they understood that we were going to do a friend's grant, not to the borough, um, that we try to fix up the outside of the main house. So that's what we've done. And uh, I have a copy here that if you approve this, the county can sign, and I have to take the signed paper down to the county. Um, this is yeah, but I didn't make. I have to make other copies, but we're gonna get a signature first. So are, <clears throat> are you? Do you still think you're on target to to finish this thing? I mean, as I drive by it every day, yeah. it's hard to sort of figure um, out where are this money that we keep putting in. And that the county this, keeps putting yeah, in. This year, um, we have almost four hundred thousand dollars. We're combining two years of grants, which will be used to fix up the outside of the what we call the barn, the cottage, the stable, and the garage, the upper building, the whole outside of that has been scraped, painted, repaired, windows. Um, I think you guys approved uh, Michael Califati's grant uh, contract. Mm -hmm. So that's what that's for. So you're going to see a lot of activity probably starting maybe late summer or something like that. I and mean, we'll have to come back to you for, for the bids because that's still a borough uh, project. So you got a grant like two years ago for 200 and something thousand. Right. Is all that work completed? And then the year before that was about 100 and I think. Is all the work completed? No, that's the work that Michael's contract covered. It took a while to do the first part, which was about all the roofs.
that was finished um, sort of the end of the summer. So he's put his new, we combined, we got permission to combine the other two years together to go do the barn. And Michael, uh, we got permission from the county to do it that way. We've done it before, we combined a couple of years together. And, uh, you know, it, it, it has a, there's a little bit of a delay, but sometimes these things just took a long time to get the contract to close out the project on the first part. Um, being on schedule is a relative term, and this all takes a long time. Um, you know, I, when, I, when I first bought the property in 2008, I said it was going to take at least 10 years to, to get the project done. It probably can take a little bit longer than that. But 10 years would be 2018, and at least by then you should see the outside of the buildings all fixed up. Um, the grant after this that we would apply for would be to fix up the inside of the cottage, um, because that is usable. And actually, our HPAC could start meeting there, and the guard clubs asked me if they could meet there. So we have to make it, you know, ADA accessible and fix up the bathroom downstairs and a couple of other things before anyone starts using it. But uh, certainly the, uh, the garden, the community garden could have an office there, uh, use it for storage. I mean, I, I really think you'll start seeing some use of the property in the year. What kind of use? Uh, HPAC would meet there, it would be community programs, community organizations would probably cruise it. And this is just the, the smaller house up at the top of the state. Um, down by the, the main house, that's really more a little open-ended, but um, I expect that, I mean, I've talked to people at the library about the possibility of having the historic um, section of the library you might have a exhibit space there or something like that, but if you're even available in the lower level for community meetings, that the library itself, among the friends of the library, um, has a lot of competition for the rooms uh, for meetings. So we can definitely use more of these space in the town. Like Is there a parking to... for enough parking for a meeting up there? Um, if it's right now, if it was a small group of say eight to ten people, yes. Um, one of the in the in the uh, historic preservation plan uh, called for the project was to provide parking down by the main that would, you know, maybe 20 spaces or something like that. I mean, you don't want to have 50 people. No, yeah, I mean, in spring house is a dead end, but... Right, but there's a the potential the limit is to how many down below the main house or possibly up by the uh, smokehouse near the, near the circle is. So you could have some parking. Probably would be split parking, by then. let's say 10 on the upper level, and 10 below. We haven't really done any drawings. But that's one of the last things you do based on the farmstead project. And the parking was like the last thing we put in. And we do have some parking in there, so. And if it's a, an occasional usage, you can just park on the grass and start it anyway. So, so it, it takes a while. A lot of work. It a lot of, a lot of paperwork. A lot of work. I had actually got a lot of help. And a lot of money. Yes, and uh, way too much. Well, I know how you feel too. Yeah. Um, in any case, it's, uh, it will be worth it. This is. This is what I call the guardian of that end of town. If you had that developed, it would just creep the green space would be kind of eliminated more and more as you go that part of 202. Once you hit Burrow Hall and go past it, it's really, you know, once you pass the quarry, it's very green. So kind of think of this almost as a gatekeeper in a way uh, for that end of town, keep it from just going into a different development path. Okay? Anybody else? Good. Thanks, Tim. Thank You'll you. You'll all be invited. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on anything? 1688. All right, 1688. It says a surety bond for $2,500. Is that a typo? Uh, Shouldn't it be too much of it now? Yeah. You see it, Tim? Yeah, um, I'll check on that, but I think this is the standard that comes from the Jeff, you know, the regulations. I'll check on that amount. But. Insurance? Only $2,500. That's just the bond. Oh, okay. We get certificates of insurance for the life Oh, okay. I have paragraph two covers the insurance. I'm not exactly sure what the bond What's the amount on the insurance? Okay. Uh, That's our normal. It might even be I think it's too many. It's right. always right. at least a million. Yeah. Can we 
throw that in there? It's, uh, there's a standard okay. form. Okay. It's a, we give them a sample certificate. You know, they have, have been doing this forever, so yeah. they're pretty familiar with it. Anyone else? Another question, and Ralph isn't here, on 1690, the, replacing the slide at Kiwanis, I thought there was um, a grant or a bequeath that purchased most of that um, equipment at Peters Park. That was prior to Lions Club and it's just about have enough money to exist, so I don't think we get money from that money. $350. It's not a lot of money. I was just surprised to see it. Right, and they do review it. Um, Ralph and John Castle and Cheryl have heads together at this so I assume. So. Know about the grant and what it's supposed to provide. Okay. Anyone else? I'll right, entertain a motion to move. Um, 16-88 through 1697. Got a motion? I'll move. Moved by Mr. Youngblood. Second. Second, Second by Mr. Galeo. Are we going to discuss the library? Shouldn't that be cool? The eight page back, sorry, 1692. Only if you want to discuss it, you want to. Well, well, we got an email. From Doug? This is just for bids. It's just for asking for bids. This is just to offer this solicit bids. Okay, that's fine. Uh, moved by Mr. Youngblood, second by Mr. DeLeo. Roll call, please. Mr. DeLeo? Yes. Mr. Youngblood? Yes. 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 Mr. DeLeo? Yes. Mr. Youngblood? Yes.
wall towards the end as you get closer to uh, Claremont Road, and we had a bid from a mason to do some repairs on that uh, wall. Uh, it's pretty well damaged right now. Um, so we're planning to do that at the same time we do the road. Liberty Road uh, survey has been done by engineering. Um, um, so it's a 20-foot wide road, which is similar to what we have from Pill Hill uh, to Maple, and 22 from Maple to Dayton Crescent. Uh, so there will be block curbing and drainage up in that area. Um, test pits for drainage and mocked out the week of the 18th. Uh, high view. Um, the, John, has you submitted the plans to ship over High View? Yeah, as you, as you know, High View is in our historic district, so any uh, modifications you do to the road or in that area needs to go to uh, down to the state for approval to look at the plans. So right now, the plans are uh, have applications been sent down to them for them to take a peek. There'll probably be a hearing at some point, John. And yeah, it typically take about a month. Okay. Um, and that that the on that road will plan for drainage and curbing. Um, Claremont step is our next discussion, probably. Yeah, let's move on. Do you want to move on to the Claremont steps, John? So, as you know, our Claremont steps on um, let's read that. Mill Street and Claremont Road are deteriorated steps that go up to the upper part of our town there. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of uh, what we're going to do with them because we can't use them right now. So we um, had an engineer look at it, and uh, we had a mason, local mason, give us a price on uh, their recommendation is to take the stairs down and repair parts of the wall because they're severely damaged. Um, and we got uh, bids for 80000 John, was that? Yeah, it's an uh, estimate from a estimate. reliable mason, 80000 200000 80, that's, that's ripping out the treads. Um, the, the base material underneath there keeps failing over the, the years I've been here. Those <coughs> steps have been repaired a couple times um, with the same result. Uh, lasts for a good five to ten years, and then eventually, whether it's limestone or bluestone, the slates, the material underneath them just gets eaten up and uh, deteriorates. So the uh, proposal is to remove the, uh, the steps and the landings to Pour, uh, put a poured concrete base there with uh, blue stone treads. Um, all the existing, we would keep the side walls that are there. Uh, everything there needs to be pointed up, including the uh, Somerset Avenue retaining wall. Um, the, the large stone um, structure that holds the upper landing has had a few stones blow out of it. There's a little reconstruction that needs to be done there too. We uh, will also need to put a, uh, a compliant handrail on the, uh, the steps. Uh, the, the rails that we have there look okay, but they're really not functional and don't meet any uh, current codes. Um, we also asked him, because we were asked uh, by council a little while ago, you know, what would it cost to uh, get rid of the steps, just you know, looking at uh, that alternate. Um, if we remove the steps, we would need to still point point up and cap the um, retaining wall to Somerset Avenue. And we'd also need to do some masonry work to fill up the hole and result by removing the steps and the landing. And he indicated that would be around 30000 John, what sort of confidence do you have that if we spend eighty to a hundred thousand, which just seems to be an unbelievable amount of money for those steps, that five or ten years from now, I mean, in the twenty-three years I've lived here, those steps, as you said, have been redone yeah. several times. I mean, it just seems to be you know a hole in the water that we're pouring money into. They've never been repaired properly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're putting you're putting a bandaid on. It looked nice, but you never really got to the root cause of the problem, which is the base material that you're putting the steps on. The and are we looking at any type of maintenance budget to maintain the stairs moving forward? Assuming we repair them, you know, is there? Is it you know? Every couple of years, we should go in there and repoint them. Um, and that's not a budget breaker, that's something that could come out of the operating budget. What does it cost to repoint them? 
round number? 5,000, 10,000? Less than five, a couple thousand, three or four thousand. But it's something that needs to just, you know, maintenance has been lacking on many things in the borough for a number of years. So <clears throat> recently there's been a lot more effort in you know, trying to take care of the things that we have. And our budgets are being built to accommodate that, so I could easily see that coming out of the you know, streets and roads budget uh, in every couple of years. What would it cost to rip the whole thing out and just put a guide rail up there? Thirty thousand. No, no, the thirty no, was to was repoint, the, repoint, the, fill the all up where the stairs come down and everything. We still need to do something. I mean, we got a, a, I don't know, eight to ten foot embankment that's holding up Somerset Avenue. So I don't think ripping it out and putting a guide rail is a yeah. I walked you know, the option. <laughs> that would be bad. I don't know. I'd say spend the thirty thousand, take it out, and put the other fifty to seventy thousand into general maintenance, or you could do a road for that. Fixing the sidewalk down, which you already have a path all the way down and around as it is right and now. Put a good rail in there. I don't know. That's my opinion. I know some of the neighbors used to like to use those steps. But it's not that long a walk. Um, I mean, it is steep. It's a liability. It's healthier to walk. It's healthier to walk. I agree with That's you. That's the mayor's campaign on I don't know. physical fitness. There it is. I like the steps, though. <clears throat> yeah, because yeah, the track team. I like the looks. It's part of the, yeah, part of the community. And uh, as John explained, we haven't maintained things correctly for years, and we're just doing it right now. So. I think you'll see a difference that'll last longer. So I really wanted to see, is anybody from that era here? No. Besides Mike. Mike? I really like to get a consensus up there, what the people how do people feel? I just haven't gotten up there. How long have those steps been here? Years, maybe maybe so Dan could write us a grant. Um, They're probably I'm historic. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Say historic. I haven't done any research on it. Okay. If they're all being redone, they're not going to be historic. And we're not doing them according to historic preservation guidelines. I would make it a 200,000. It'll project. be a hybrid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, <clears throat> at this point, we're, we're basing our decision on estimates from the engineer? Estimates from a reliable yes. contractor that does a lot of work around this area. Can we review this on Thursday in finance and see how we're at? Because, I mean, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's and a lot, and in there's so many works. things that have to be done. I mean... We can talk about it when Ralph comes back. I like back old and... things, but <laughs> sometimes... <laughs> The amount of dollars I think spent per resident is what's got me bothered. Well, the other thing to look at is if, if the steps weren't there and somebody came forward and said, hey, we want to put these stairs in to save uh, walking 100 feet around the corner, we'd tell them they were crazy. But it's just, uh, you know, they're there already, so hey, let's, let's keep it or get rid of it. I don't know that anybody would argue putting them in. I don't know. Is there anything really historic about those other than they're pretty old? <laughs> I, I Dan's creating his team there. I mean, I mean <laughs> no, no, I have been asked this question. So you have an answer? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I would have to do your research and find out who built it. Uh, my, I suspect it was the Somerset Hills Land Association that would group of the wealthy guys up on the mountain and do improvements in the area. But that's a gift. Or somebody had a house up the hill and needed steps. We also do <laughs> know that the stone that's used on the parapet wall going up is not original stone. It's a it's not a Bernardsville field stone. It's a Pennsylvania type stone. So it's it's not original. What's going up? Gotcha. I mean, there was never. Any, any All right, we'll talk about. We got to talk about it. finance. I mean, yeah. this is this, 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 in finance this is a wish, works. not a need. To yeah. a certain extent, you know, yeah. there's wants and needs. Yeah. Mike, you want to weigh in? I know, uh, like some of the kids going down to uh, Penguin, yeah. you know, shoot down that way. And somehow right. commuters go down in steps. Yeah, true. But I mean, well, they don't now because nobody uses them. If they were repaired, they, 
probably be more traffic on them. Only 25 steps or so left, right, John? No, it's more than that. No, it's more than that. All right, so we'll discuss we this further in committee? Yeah, we got to talk All right. about finance right, because this sure is that this goes on two weeks from a lot of money. Agenda. So you guys can talk. Now, yeah. finance One, can talk. And we and could do some road. <laughs> <laughs> That's my point. We could do a road. And, and one thing. My road needs a lot of help. <laughs> One thing to go there. On the list. We can't go there. <laughs> All right, Bill. Go ahead. One thing to mention is um, part of the reason the cost is getting as high as it is is because we keep kicking it down the road each year. Now, obviously, two weeks is not going to change that, but we have discussed some numbers where you know every year we don't repair that upper wall. It may cost us an additional five to ten thousand dollars because it's continuing to fall apart. So, either way, I think we should make the decision this year and act on it. Agreed. No, that's not. Okay. Two, two weeks. All right. Yeah. Next meeting. All right. Camp Jatoni donation. Mike. Yeah, I included. Um, That's the map. The, the map. Yeah. I was struggling to figure out where that was. <laughs> it's right on the uh, Old Sterling Road, off of uh, Washington. It's on. Okay. There more. Where is it? There's a color one, the last one. You, you got to go to uh, one yeah. of the attachments. Well, we had, I think, both in the package, and there's a separate color picture. Yes. Yeah, it's the last item on the package for 2516. Now, I, I went down to the quarry. Weldon is actually donating the stone free. Just have to have a truck go there and pick it up. And since it's, you know, we'll be taking the mulch from the uh, landfill, uh, I talked to John and everything else, and I talked to Ralph. It doesn't seem to be a, a big issue right now. But uh, scoping the sanitary, we're probably going to have to have someone come in because we don't have the wherewithal right now within the, uh, the actual town itself. We usually contract that out. So I'll have to talk to Ralph about that and see what the cost is. You know, have somebody go out and scope it and take a look at it. So, what are, what are you asking for now? Oh, this is the same thing what I've been asking for: two loads of mulch for the camp, and then just picking up two loads of stone at the quarry and dropping it off. All they're doing is dropping it off, so the people there at the camp, all the volunteers, can put it in for all the uh, access roads and the handicap paths. And this public works doing that. That's our guys. We're all public works is doing is actually driving a truck, dropping it off. Volunteers from you know all over Somerset County are going to be there mm -hmm. to actually do. No, that. I was just trying to get a cost to scale. Yes. All right, so and then, much, and I, I would think it's four loads. It's probably a truck for a day, probably. And the scoping of the uh, the line is something separate. It's, we just don't know the numbers. I, I don't know the number. I would have to talk to Ralph and John and see what the cost would be mm -hmm. for that. So we need a motion or. Um, I would just see everything I guess. Okay. Um, I want to entertain a motion to um, work with Camp Jotoni with donations. Um, moved by Mr. Deportier. A second. A second. Second by Mr. Youngblood. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? <coughs> the ayes have it. All right, anything else from Public Works? Engineering, technology, anything? Do I need any other things? Library. Oh, library. I was going to say, do we need to ratify <laughs> option one versus option two? Yeah, I don't think. <laughs> it sounded like option one was sort of the way to go, but I didn't know whether we needed to approve that. We will be asked, um, in, in public course, we talked about it, and you know, initially the thought of spending initially 200000 and $310,000 with um, not quite the uh, reduction in the heating costs that was anticipated. Uh, the question was raised, you know, can we talk to the engineer and you know, see what, see what it would be to uh, 
but they support hot water heating in there. And, and Doug uh, reached out to the engineer, and you know, the pro proposal you see before you is an option. Uh, it will greatly reduce the, uh, the heating expenses, but your payback period is like 100 years. Um, so it's a, very, it's a very expensive proposition, but at least we know the number now. Yeah. Um, so we still think we met with the, uh, the library board and uh, uh, sure, Pat Kennedy Grant, uh, a member from the Friends, uh, Councilman Youngblood, Doug, myself, and Ralph, and had a very good meeting, and they're on board with this option. Uh, they fully support um, us uh, replacing the rooftop units and doing the conversion from uh, electric to gas for the uh, preheaters for the VAP. So we'd be looking for the council. Right. You approved the resolution already, mm -hmm. but that resolution was to give us the authorization to go out and bid for the option one that you have in front of you. Well, I will move that we put it, you know, spend the 310000 and whatever small dollars to put the H back on the roof. According to option one on the email that Doug sent us on mm -hmm. whatever date that was. That's the recommendation of the Public Works April Committee. April 22nd. So, um, all right. Moved by Councilman Lee. Anyone? Second. Second by Mr. DePoitier. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? The ayes have it. A few minor things. The basketball courts up for uh, polo grounds. Um, as you know, our contract was awarded. They should be starting mid to end of May once um, the folks that are doing um, Sycamore move their uh, supplies out of that parking lot. They'll move in and start working there. So, uh, so we're, we have a timing issue there. We have to get people moving to get the other guy in because he needs to set up his... Uh, They're going to grade up that lot next. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. pretty messy right now. All right. Uh, what else we have here? We have a pothole patcher in town, which actually is really good. We free up our guys to do some storm sewer repairs, so they're, they're, our guys are working on that while we have somebody patching the potholes. It's the same firm that we used last year. And I think he's done right now, John? Yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's He went through in a couple weeks, and we, we're good. Uh, my Mount Road sections two, three from Claremont to Post Cunhard. That's our one of our projects for next year. We see received the grant for two hundred and twenty-three thousand for that. And and our next item here is parking signs in the downtown area. So we have to address where we're going to put parking signs. So our little committee needs to start working on that. All right. Okay. And I think that's about it. Anything else, Sean? Um, sure. I don't know if, if any of y'all went by uh, Burns High on Saturday. We had a very successful electronics uh, cleanup. Phew, the uh, county <laughs> provided us with two containers. Jan has been in traction all week. We took out six containers worth. They were in here today, road department, loading up more containers. So, uh, six containers. It was yeah. a, it was a, a The cars just kept coming and coming and coming. So that was a county project? Is that the... No, it was the oh, green team. Green team. Bob and Rosalie Baker really get the credit. Uh, Somerset County provided us uh, containers and uh, is actually taking the materials at no cost. It used to cost us $2,500. Uh, the road department was there helping people uh, unload and load up the containers. So was Janet. <laughs> when is the uh, junk uh, drop-off? May 21st. May 21st. May 21st. On the borough webpage now, it'll be in the Burnsville News a couple of times. Is that limited to anything uh, material-wise? I mean, I know no paint and things like that, but anything? No, where are you at? What do you have in mind, Chris? Well, I'm, I'm saying for me. You brought this stuff home from work, and it's. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a technical Next question. <laughs> no hazardous materials, nothing that can be recycled, um, no construction materials. Don't tear up your deck and bring it up there. Um, we like to limit it to a pickup truck or van load so people don't get crazy with it. Um, so pretty much anything on the tractors, refrigerators, uh, air conditioners. Uh, I spoke to Tom Wood. Uh, we are going to work something out with Ludlow so people can bring it 
with their refrigerant, and we'll take care of decommissioning them, recycling the uh, coolant. Mm. Good. One other question on Mika Road. Are we going to coordinate the timing with that with any 202 road closures down in Far Hills? Because that's sort of... They should be done with their road work unless there's Route 4 uh, work being done by Del Lapel. They should be out of here before we uh, even get in there. Okay. Okay. And stuff lower down, isn't there going to be some stuff going on in Far Hills? Or not? They've already done the uh, concrete work in Far Hills. So all that's left there is a million pages. All right, anything else? That's it. Very good. Um, we received a full approval from the freeholder board to move forward with a turf field with the county. Um, county engineering will be contacting us, John, in about a week or so. And we'll be sitting down and talking about different proposals and options. All right, other committee re or commission reports? Um, green team. Ed English works hard on grants every year, and we received a $2,000 sustainable New Jersey grant. Um, I went road down and met him in Cranford, and we picked up a check and bought it to Ralph within 48 hours. So, <laughs> 24 hours actually. <laughs> <Right in. laughs> um, anyone else? Bill, also, anything else? Uh, next Saturday, there is the free tree pickup at the pool parking lot. Um, I think Joe is running that. Joe, Joe, running Joe will be there. Yeah. The um yeah that's you next. You want to elaborate? You want to elaborate on any of the details? Right, we did it two years two years ago, right? Two years ago, the swimming pool, nine to twelve, and we give away saplings. Probably three or four to each person this year, depending on how many we get from the state. We don't know till we pick them up on Friday, and what kind they are. We don't know. Thanks, Joe, for course. Um, they get you pickaxe so you can go through the rock to plant it. <laughs> um, the library, um, Homes of Distinction, coming yes. up May 15th. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, there's going to be an uh, event this uh, Saturday at 30th, and it goes over the history. Um, there was a great article in the Burnsville News. I think uh, Dave wrote it. That no, was Barry. <laughs> But, uh, you know, just with the architect, the historic nature of it was the Astor uh, residence way back when. Okay. Uh, the guy that did all the uh, area around the building and everything else was the same architect that did Central Park oh. homesteads. And uh, it's a uh, Hooser's. It's, it's, it's a, you might want to get a ticket just to walk through the building because it's a beautiful building. It's a very, good very thing. good thing for the library. Very good. Um, two things out of HPAC. Um, <clears throat> there's a photo exhibit at the library. Uh, it's, Dan's got a flyer there. What's the date that starts? Uh, it, uh, the reception is May 19th, but it's for the full month of May. Right, so the, it runs for the month of May. It's a photo exhibit. Where the preparation is for last year, uh, we did a uh, walking tour of the Alcott district mm -hmm. and this year uh, trying to put a walking tour of downtown in terms of the historic uh, property so this is starting with a photo exhibit for the month of May there'll be a reception on May 19th at 530 in the library uh, all the photos will be up um, the, Jack the second um, in terms of the the lease discussion yes is that something we should we mentioned that. Should we talk about that in closed session? Um, yeah, I, I've been communicating with Vince Pizzano. I got the letter from him. Uh, I responded. Uh, I spoke to him last week. Actually, we're pretty close. So maybe we better on the work session together. We can have something to copy and discuss. Okay. Yeah, just we're rapidly moving in that direction, so just try to get that put together. Okay. Anyone else? Um, yeah, just as a reminder, I don't know whether everyone's done it or not, but we all have to do our training. now. Um, you know, it takes you about half an hour. You, Sandy resent the instructions out, but it's worth two hundred and fifty dollars. You know, for each of us to do that, and we also have to do the financial disclosure things. 
So, and it all has to be done by End May 1. Or maybe it's End April 30th. So don't leave it to May 1. Do it by April 30th. I'm all done. Mom has spoken. Mom has spoken. <laughs> and if you've done it, make sure that Sandy knows. And, the line, and if, you know, we've had a great period in the past for the disclosures. We're not getting any information about a grace period, which means they may start finding it. And the dollar that Ralph keeps promising is going to come. It's gone. <laughs> All right. Um, nothing else, anyone? All right. Items of business 11A, membership in the Somerset County Business Partnership. One from April 1st of 16 to March 31st of 17. Did we benefit at all from the $1,250 we spent last year on this? I thought the Meet the Mayor's event that they had um, was a good event. Um, I mean, we haven't asked the county partnership for much input. I know Baskin Ridge tends to use them a lot more with, you know, they've got buildings that are unoccupied and how can the county help them to try to get... Uh, uh, tenants and things going you know, on, on a larger scale. You know, they're we have filling the library. library. <laughs> 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 they, they're talking more, uh, you know, a via size space. So um, I don't, you know what? And it doesn't mean uh, we can't talk to them about some of our, our mm -hmm. smaller parcels. That's just typically not what Mike's been involved in. So um, I think know. it's worth maintaining our membership to keep good relations with the county and. Um, you know, Especially if we, the economy gets better. Yeah, if the economy gets better, it will help our downtown district okay. and possibly the library. So, right. it's up to you guys. No, I think I'd support it. Okay. Me too. All in favor? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Okay. You guys have it. All right, rental space in lower level of the library, 11B, silver contract expiring April 13, 2016. We, we had talked about going in house. That was here tonight. I don't know well, yeah, and that and that contract expired on the thirteenth. Yes, so at this point, we're under no obligation. Correct. Um, yeah, I did. I did uh, just mention it to the office manager at uh, Caldwell Banker here in town. Gave me a recommendation of a commercial, so I don't, I don't know where we want to, you know, if we want to do that in house or. Yeah. Can we go that route again? I said we go in house for right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Are we? <clears throat> can we do both, or is it a situation where we've? If we enter an agreement with a particular broker, when no, they you're in the real estate business, isn't yeah. it? Then we're gonna have to pay the commission. Well, well you could put a yeah, I guess we don't do a yeah. named exclusion, but we don't know that person. Yeah, we don't have any leads right now, so we're not in progress. So we have to pay the commission regardless. So maybe, maybe it's we, we could float it. We could see right after a month or two and see what happens. So yeah, yeah. So okay, so maybe you get know, out with the broker. Why don't we try a 60 day Sounds period good. of in house? Yeah. Let's see how we make out. We haven't done anything. Well, it's the first way. And Bill, we could bring it to Somerset County Business Partnership. There we go. And see if they have any leads for us. Call them tomorrow. Yes. All right. So, you want so we're in favor of staying in house? We'll try that. Doug will be the lead. I guess it depends on this, you know. The division. Yeah. 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 Maybe. You do have Right, that back, that big room that well, looks out over so, I mean, um, Anderson the Hill is nice. The from, the, from the foyer, from the hallway there, into the next suite, and then you also have what with uh, Anderson Hill Road. It's not going anywhere, so we should entertain whatever. Yeah, at this point, right. entertain whatever the offers we get. And then we'll because if you split it up and everything else, somebody else might want the other side. Say, examine everything. 
All right, thanks, Doug. All right, correspondence. We got a notice regarding the Skylands tour, the cure, which will travel through Burnersville on Sunday, June 5th. I know the police have been notified. They do give us insurance certificates, but in fact, they're not using us for days other than just driving for it. Um, they're they're covering us as long as I have the police know I have any yeah, yeah. Like they usually post something on that um, electric sign in front of the fire department. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a train station. Okay. Um, second open session. Anybody from the public question to be heard? Council members, anything before we go into closed session? I'll entertain a motion to move into closed session where we'll um, uh, into executive session where we'll consider um, Tectra Trek Incorporated contract negotiations. We, we also have one other thing on uh, insurance requirements for one of our contractors. Okay. All right. And additional insurance requirements for one of our contractors. Are we coming out, you think, or no? No. Okay. No. Okay. Not trying to anything out the All right. Councilman Schmidt? Mm -hmm. I'll second. Second by. Mr. Youngblood, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. We could vote one day not to <laughs> come out of, or not to adjourn the day of the Right? Yeah. We would do it, some of us. The only one that would be capable of doing that would be Joe. <laughs> I'm going to read War and Peace. Yeah. <laughs> it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> Which is not war of peace, but. <laughs> Tell two cities. Yeah. Dickens. Yeah.